We are back. Welcome back to another season of In Her Shoes. Today we are talking with three-time best-selling author, global speaker, and coach. Here she is, Andrea Owen. I am going to bring you on, my love. I am so excited for this conversation. Let's see. She comes on. Hi. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm so excited for you. Honey. You know, I want to say this for the record that you are the world's greatest hype woman. <laughs> <laughs> I love you so much. Give me some hearts, everybody, if you agree that that, yeah. <laughs> that Kelly is. <laughs> you will. Congratulations. Thank you. Look, make some noise. I love that you and so you are three times best selling author, a global speaker, a coach. We've known each other for years. Um, you've just been so inspirational to me. Um, you've guided me along my journey in some instances. And I just want to say thank you. And I'm so happy for you. Um, so I just want to dive in and just yeah. thank you. Yeah, and yeah, like, I'm thank you for excited. being here. Um, yeah, and I just want to say, you know, internet years are like dog years. So we've known each other online for probably almost a decade, which is like a hundred years. So a <laughs> hundred. And I just love like, you're so real, like, no bullshit. You know, like, it's, it's so refreshing. It's I try. So refreshing. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I'm doing my chapter one workbook right now. Ah, so we have Yay! three years. Yes. Awesome. Yes. I love hearing that. Yeah. So, yeah. So tell us all the things, Andrea. Like, why did you write this book? I want to get more into the book, like the details of it. Um, so let's just dive right in. Yeah. Um, and that's Rebecca, by the way. Good job, Rebecca. Uh, I, I wrote it because, and I say this in the introduction, I wrote it partly because I was pissed off. I was pissed off that our culture, and I had known this for a long time, but I, I didn't completely make the connection that our, our culture raises girls and women to be fundamentally insecure. You know, and then I, I thought to myself, like, you know, all of the challenges, well, I should say most of the challenges that my clients come to me with, the perfectionism, the imposter syndrome, the people pleasing, that stems from the culture that raised us. And so I felt like I could not talk about women's empowerment anymore without talking about the elephant in the room. And that is patriarchy. And it's not, this book is not, um, it's not a feminist theory book. And, and this is also not to say that men don't have their challenges as well. Patriarchy hurts everyone. And um, my specialty is women. That's who I serve. I have the experience as identifying as a woman. And so that, that's really why I wrote the book. Amazing. Yeah. And so let's dive into that because okay. let's dive in a little bit deeper because um, I'm all about that. Uh, and we can go as deep as you, as you want to. I know like we talk about, I mean, I know, I think there's a chapter in your book, like with brainwashing and like mm -hmm. all of the things, society and, and the pressures that are on us. So I would love for you to like dive more in. I think you said like, isn't the chapter on brainwashing like the longest chapter or something like that? Yeah, it's the longest chapter, and, and we were originally going to lead with that, and I, I didn't want to scare people. Like, not that it's scary at all, but it's, I tell a pretty emotional story in the beginning of kind of when I had my own awakening. So I start a little bit more, um, not softer, but anyway, you'll, you'll see when you read the table of contents. But yeah, that chapter is mostly about uh, sort of narrowing in on our culture and, and sort of how we're raised. So for instance, the punishment versus reward. As girls and women, we are rewarded when we are quiet and polite and put everyone else's comfort before our own, uh, especially if we are accommodating, if we are um, nurturing. And this isn't to say those are bad virtues. Like, no, I'm not telling people to go out there and flip tables and flip off your boss. Like, it's not about mm -hmm. that. It's about just getting curious about, you know, how we were programmed and, and socially conditioned. But we're rewarded when we are the quote unquote good girl, when we are the good woman. And many, many times we are punished if we sort of veer away from that. You know, if you look at, um, I, I think you're maybe my age, a little bit younger, but when I was growing up, Madonna was really just rising to fame. And she was the person who was really pushing the envelope. And she was 
making some noise for sure. And she was vilified and crucified for it, for being expressive, for being sexually expressive. And, you know, I was eight years old when Like a Virgin came out. And I mean, that was like the pearl clutching that was happening and she was punished for yeah. that. And so it's just an example, one example of many of, of, you know, the culture and how it kind of shames us into being a certain way. And then when we veer out of that, there is risk involved for sure. Yeah. So I'm sure you've dived deeper into this, you know, in the book and the workbook. What are some of those ways? Because I know I had it I, and I'm still unlearning all of that good girl syndrome and all of that unraveling, unlearning. And, and I was like such a people pleaser, like yeah. such like, to my own self-sacrificing and sabotaging ways, right? So what are some things that, and, and maybe even in your journey that helped you, that you can tell like some of these women who are right in the same spot? Because I feel like there's different layers and levels to it. I don't know if you agree with 100%. that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, like give us some hearts if you consider yourself a people pleaser or if you were a people pleaser, that's one of the ways that, that it manifests. and. You know, it, it really, it depends. I, you know, I wrote in my last book that there's a difference between approval seeking and being a people pleaser and they, they, they go hand in hand, but they're a little bit different. Sometimes we grow up and we, it's not necessarily that we people please, that, but we do tend to really want the validation and, and approval from others. And honestly, like that's just part of the human experience for most people. But uh, now I totally forgot what your question is about people pleasing. <laughs> how do we get over, like, how do we okay. start to chip away at like, Good question. get over yeah. that? Because I know for me, I mean, I'm still in the process of chipping away at it and, yeah. and it's been taking years. Yeah, like, it does. And same, same over here. And it's, it's not necessarily a, a, you know, a, a destination that we get to. It, it can be like a lifelong unraveling process. And one of the things that I've been talking about in interviews, just to kind of give people a taste of how to start chipping away at this is, so I ask over 250 questions in this book. And one of the questions that I start out with in the introduction is I talk about, you know, the question of what is your conditioning versus what is your truth? So as a people pleaser, your conditioning might tell you that it is disrespectful to set a boundary with your mother. Um, your conditioning might tell you that it is greedy and opportunistic to ask for a raise at work or ask one of your colleagues who is another life coach to um, help you promote your new book. Your conditioning might tell you that if you grew up with traditional gender roles in your family, your conditioning might tell you that it's not okay to ask your partner for more balance with the chores around the house and that you should be the one to do it. But your truth is that it's okay to ask for help with your new program that's coming out. And it's really on the other person to say yes or no. Your truth is that there should be balance within a household. That's just how humans work together. The truth is that you, you know, deserve to be paid more money for your nine to five job. And so sometimes, it's not just about taking this massive action. That's important for sure. And I can teach mm -hmm. you how to do that. But before that, we need to take a step back and ask ourselves these really important questions of what is sometimes unconscious in your conditioning that wasn't ever explicitly taught to you as a child or at school or in your, you know, your church or whatever. But it was sort of like the unsaid rules, like this is how things work around here that we mm -hmm. all have experienced. And again, many times it's, it's in our uh, uh, subconscious and we don't know what's happening, but it's ruling how we behave. Yeah. Oh my gosh. hundred percent. What, um, cause you have the book also, it's like split into two like parts, right? Yeah. This one you mean? Yeah. Yeah, so the first half is, um, so the publisher did not want me to put a curse word in the title of this book like I did those two. Yeah. Uh, so I got away with it by calling the two sections of the book shit to start doing and shit to stop doing, which like, to be honest, trade secret, the chapters could have been like <laughs> either way, depending on how you word it. But yeah, it's broken up into two sections and um, shit to start doing and shit to stop doing. What was your favorite part to write? Oh my gosh, there was so many. Um, 
probably that chapter that we just talked about, chapter nine, stop allowing the, bra the brainwashing to make you small. Um, because I, I tell a personal story in it of my own awakening. And I, I don't know if there's one particular part, but my favorite thing about this book was asking all the questions because I want the reader, it's less prescriptive and more like I'm teaching the reader to coach themselves yeah. because I don't have all the answers. As much as my ego likes to think that I do, mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't. Mm -hmm. And it's up to the reader to get curious about their own life and come to their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. I just, I love how you go so deep into it, like the conditioning, the brainwashing, the patriarchy, because it's so important. And I don't, my, my opinion, I don't think it's talked about as much as it needs to be. I agree. Um, and there's so much programming. I mean, I'm also even working through my own trauma and conditioning. Same. And um, there's just, it's just, you learn something new every day. <laughs> so it's like... Sure do when you start chipping away. And I, I also want to emphasize that I don't think it's talked enough in the personal development industry. Um, I think we're finally getting to a place where we're moving away from toxic positivity. And I have been guilty of that, you know, in the beginning of my career. And then I, I sort of learned more about the law of attraction and was like, um, <laughs> but what about, I have some questions and, and I, and this is kind of where my journey has taken me, where I also, Kelly, like, I love to get to the root of the problem. Like I'm obsessed with it. Like, let's just like find the, the fastest way to efficiency and to solve this problem. And I, I think that for sure, for a long time, for me and my work, it was shame. Like that is driving a lot of our thoughts and our decisions or our indecisions. And I also think it's our culture. And, and I, I just, I'm always been the person who's like, can we just talk about the elephant in the room as uncomfortable as it is? And that's really what this book is. I love that. And I feel like you've always been like that. Like I that's why I loved you so, cause I'm like, yes, girl, like speak it. Like, let's, let's talk about the uncomfortable stuff. Let's talk about the stuff, like the, the stuff, it's, it's kind of like um, when you say like the, the toxic positivity, it's like, are we putting a bandaid over like things that like, what, we're not talking about it. Like, why aren't we talking about it? Exactly. And um, I was just reading an Instagram post today. My friend, Britt Frank, who's brilliant, who's also writing a book. She's a therapist and she was talking about how sometimes like you can have all the tools and the advice and the tips and the tricks and the hacks. And sometimes they don't work because your nervous system needs to be addressed. And I was like, absolutely positively. And I think in the coaching industry, this is something that we need to talk about and that we need to vet our clients. I mean, I can't tell you how many I've referred out to therapy just because uh, I can, I can tell, especially like seeing them on zoom. I'm like, this is beyond just you learning how to manage your mindset yeah. and manage your negative self-talk. There's either unresolved trauma, there's either depression or anxiety, like chronic anxiety happening. And, and, and we can't just cheerlead our way through that. I have tried. <laughs> doesn't work. And sometimes it's neurobiological and sometimes it's these old deep conditioning that we've all received. Mm -hmm. So what, so what can the reader expect going through this book? Like you said, it's, it's more of also like a, you're coaching yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say, like, how, how to approach the book? Is there any, like, is it from start to finish? Can they like start with chapter nine? Yeah, that's how I like to write books is I like to write them because I'm like that. I like to look at the table of contents and what am I most excited about? What can I procrastinate on and not feel guilty about? So that's definitely, you can read the table of contents, look at what you your intuition is kind of tapping you on the shoulder and saying like, go to this one. Mm -hmm. um, and if I mention a, a tool that I've already talked about previously, I will tell you which chapter it, it's in so you can go and, and read that. Um, you, they can expect, if, they're, if they've read my work before, they can expect the same tone and voice uh, where I'm like kind of like, a lot of people call me their the big sister they wish they had or, you know, their best friend. They wish that I was their neighbor because I tell it like it is, but also am compassionate. And I tell a lot more personal stories in this book. It's it's not memoirish, but it's I definitely go in deeper. I noticed they were more personal as I was uh, narrating the audio book and how it was it was hard. I had to take breaks after telling some of the stories. And yeah, that's what they can expect. 
Right. I love that. And I think people like to hear, people love to hear like the mess, right? That, that like, because we all have a mess. We all, we all struggle. Um, I know it's kind of a loaded question. You kind of alluded to it a little bit, but what, what do you want the reader to take away and feel like after, after reading this book? Yeah. I love that question. And that is actually a question that if anyone's writing a book, I don't care if it's fiction or nonfiction. That's the question you should ask yourself before you write it and while you're writing it. I want people to get really curious about their life, more specifically their conditioning. That, that is the absolute bottom line of what I want them to walk away with. I want them to get very, very curious and also even better come at it from a place of non-judgment. So this isn't about, um, you know, all men are bad or my parents screwed up raising me like that actually like if you need to go through that then go through that but that doesn't help solve the problem and that's not what i'm saying to do i want people to just like let's open our eyes about it let's talk about it and let's get really curious about how it affects you now that's mm -hmm. that's what matters and and don't judge it it's not good or bad it just is and that's how we move forward and also that's how we change the culture that's how we change social socially for the next generation mm -hmm. I love that you said, because you said shame was your kind of, you know, Achilles heel. And then also you're bringing in like the judgment. Uh, do you find people just like within your environment and what you're seeing, is that like the number one thing that you see people do is like shame themselves, judge themselves, think bad about themselves? Yeah, hundred percent. And it, it's so interesting. Like if you would have told me that I was going to do shame work, you know, when I was 25, if you would have said that I would have laughed hysterically. And then I went and got trained, um, in trained and certified in Brene Brown's modality it, back in 2014. And it, it, it profoundly changed my life. I do. I think so many of our decisions are based in either, um, they're based in shame or they're based in trying to avoid shame. And it's just, mm. Again, part of the human experience. We judge all the time. It, it's what we do as humans. And I think that sometimes it can help, you know, like if we're trying to judge someone's character, like, is this person safe or not? Should I mate with this person? Does this person have food? You know what I mean? Like that kind of judgment. And then there's also the kind of judgment of, uh, I don't like that person and I don't like what they did. I don't like their behavior, but it's all based in judgment and shame, 100%. And I stopped beating myself up for judging like several years ago. And I'm like, it's just what we do. Like, but when is it negatively impacting my relationships? When is it negatively impacting myself? I, I personally find the, the attitude of like, stop judging or you're bad if you judge. And like, that's nobody doesn't judge. Like those are robots. Those aren't people. And again, that's just my opinion, but yeah, I stopped agonizing over it a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I want to say hi to Sarah. I'm bending the, the tread with Ali. Hi, ladies. Everyone, thank you so much for joining. Uh, we're getting into like deeper topics. And I love this, Andrea, that you're bringing up. This is judgment because I think also I see with my clients a lot, like they judge themselves. Like they're their own worst critics. And of course, we're, you know, we're judging all of it, right? And, um, and I know you do that work too of like, you know, acknowledging, yes, I'm judging myself, and then how do we move on from it, right? Um, so I guess, what, is there any, like, I don't know, two or three tips that, that, that have been helpful for you or your clients or in this book that you want to mm -hmm. share with us? In terms of, like, the negative self-talk and the self-judgment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So one of the things that, that actually brought me to write this book was from that question. And because I, when I started my career, I talked a lot about the inner critic which is actually what brought me to shame work because I realized there was some of my clients who just could not move past it. And it was just this chronic inner critic. And then that's what brought me to like, oh, this is shame that's actually happening. And so I teach shame resilience, but people would ask me, you know, where does this negative self-talk come from? Like why, you know, I know it's universal, but like, what does it stem from? And it's three ways. So it can stem from your family of origin, how you were spoken to, how other people were spoken about. It can also come from a past relationship that you had, maybe that wasn't so great. It also comes from um, just your wiring. So some people are more shame prone um, versus guilt prone. Some people have rejection sensitivity and it just, it varies. It's a spectrum and that leads to some people have more negative self-talk than others. And then it also comes from our culture. 
mm-hmm. that, <laughs> that it's, again, the culture that we were raised in that, that typically raises girls and women to be fundamentally insecure. So I say that so people can start recognizing it. And maybe it is your wiring. If you are neurodivergent, if you have chronic anxiety or depression, then your negative self-talk is probably gonna need more support than somebody who doesn't struggle with those things. Um, if it's a family of origin thing, then trauma therapy works and helps. You know, you and I have, have both yeah. done that. And if it's um, a, a lot of our culture, then get curious about that. You know, that question that I asked, what is my conditioning versus what is my truth? That is something you can carry with you to try to unpack and unravel some of that BS. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah. And it's, it's so, it's so true, right? Everyone is in like a different spot. Everyone has different conditioning. And I like what you said, like with society, we get bombarded, like yeah. bombarded. And, um, you know, I even look at my like niece, she's three and I'm like, OMG, you know, yeah. like it's, it's, you know, you don't want to see it, but then you're like, OMG, like it's, it's, it's happening. You know, that's just kind of. It is. And I want to also like give credit where credit is due. And I say this in the book, like we still have a long way to go culturally and socially. And we've also come a long way. Yeah. We really have. I mean, if you're talking about feminism. There was a time in the 1970s, which is the decade I was born, where women could not get credit cards without a co-signer that was either their husband or their father. Even if they were single and had a full-time job, they still had to get permission to get a credit card, which is like mind blowing. And also I love, especially, you know, like Generation Z, millennials too, but Gen Z is really pushing about just diversity with body size. Like you go to Target now and you see more, larger bodies of mannequins. I mean, even on social media, like I think about when I was in my twenties, like if I would have seen young women that were my age, you know, in bikinis with their tummy showing and their stretch marks, like I don't know if I would have had an eating disorder. Like my life would be different. Yeah. My life would be totally different. So I'm so happy that we're seeing some changes. And at the same time, there's still a lot of work to, to do. Yeah. Okay. So where can people get the book? And like, and do you have a workbook with it? Like, tell us more so we can dive deeper into this work. Cause I think it's so powerful. And in my opinion, it's so needed. So um, anywhere books are sold, online, in bookstores, if you're going to venture out, wear a mask, wash your hands. And um, yes, the workbook, because I asked over 250 questions, I wanted a workbook for people that they didn't have to buy. And the lovely people at the publishers made a beautiful matching workbook. And it's all at andreaowen.com slash noise. And I'm doing a book club for free that starts on September 20th. And it's at that same link, andreaowen.com slash noise. Amazing. So what's the book club all about? Like, are you going to be walking? We're going through my four, I don't want to say they're my favorite chapters, but they're four chapters that really embody self-confidence and cover the main theme of the book. So it's chapters one, two, and three, which are uh, take up space, shine too bright, and ask for everything that you want. And then in the last week, we're going to go over that whopper of a chapter, which is chapter nine, all about culture and brainwashing that you mentioned. And I, I don't want to overload people. That's why I picked, you know, four super important chapters. And we're going to do a chapter a week for a month. Okay. I want to talk about two things before we, we wrap up. Uh, so I love this whole thing about taking up space mm-hmm. and like also asking for what you need, like, and receiving, like, these are all like, these are the top three things that I see women in my universe uh, struggle with. Yeah. What, why is that? Like, why, why can't we take up space? Why do we have such a hard time receiving and allowing? Like, what is your, what is your thoughts on that? Well, it's, it goes back a lot to that, that um, punishment versus reward. We are rewarded more when we don't take up space, when we allow space, especially for men, when we allow space for others, you know, like think about the, the amount of times we apologize mm-hmm. and move out of the way, you know, with our bodies and, um, you know, many times try to cover up. And, and there are other variables that, that make it um, feel unsafe for us to do that. But even, even things like, um, you know, speaking up your opinion there, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed this, but there's been a sort of an influx of negative, nasty comments on Facebook ads and Instagram ads. And especially I tell the story of, of my friend and colleague McKenna Held, who, um, you know, put out a Facebook ad and she wasn't even showing that much cleavage and the amount of 
hate that she was getting. And, and we kind of expect it from men. I hate to say it, but we do. We're, we're, we're kind of used to it. But from women, and that's internalized misogyny, you know, and, and I talk about that in the book. But just there's, there's this inherent risk that we have when we do take up space. So it becomes safer to not do it at all. And then it becomes a habit. And it becomes this, um, for some people, like a trauma response where we just stay quiet and shut down, whether it's having a conversation with our partner or doing a Facebook ad in a gorgeous dress and red lipstick. So uh, taking up space and, well, okay, I was going to go off on a tangent, but I'll let you ask. The other no, okay, go ahead. No, I, yeah, go off on a tangent. Yeah. I just love, I love the topic of taking up space because it's, it's a term that gets thrown around a lot in our circles. And I wanted to get to the bottom of like, what does that actually mean? The way I look at taking up space, it's taking up space with your voice. So that's giving an opinion, that's asking for what you want. And it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be loud volume wise, like you and I typically are. <laughs> Do it in your own way, whatever that is. So taking up space with your body is, you know, asking for the armrest on the airplane or not getting out of the way on, on in the street, you know, but be, still being respectful. And it's also, body acceptance, size acceptance, like we were just talking about, like wear the damn bikini, even if you're, you know, a size 16 or whatever you are. And it's also taking up space with your power and your confidence. So that, that can look like goal setting, you know, moonshot goals and going after them, even if, if you don't reach them completely. Taking up space with your power and confidence also looks like deciding that you belong in rooms where decisions are being made, deciding that you belong in leadership positions, whether it's on the PTA or whether it's running for your state representative. That's what it means to take up space. I love that. I love Me that. too. <laughs> and like, you, I like what you said, any, any form of it. It, it. it even could be like speaking up in meetings. Exactly. Right? And being like, I don't really care what you think of me or my reputation. Like, this is what I'm doing. 100%. Mm -hmm. Huge. Huge. Um, so what else? L final last words, Andrew. This is, I, I'm excited to get the book. I want everyone to get the book, whether they're watching live or, or the replay. Um, and yeah, w any last words? Um, I think I just want to, just add with, you know, you mentioned the ask for everything that you want. And I, I often joke that like, I want to get that spray painted on the side of my house. Like women's empowerment begins with women asking for what they want. I just, you know, I interviewed Jess King, who's a Peloton instructor, and she's um, she's a friend of mine. And uh, I asked her, because she is a woman who asks for what she wants. And I asked her, like, where did you learn that? Because most women don't. And some of the, like, she'll just ask for whatever. And some people might view that as opportunistic. And it's not that she's being disrespectful. It's that she's just, she asks for it. And sometimes you're like, damn, okay, just, you just, you just ask. And she said her mom told her that her mom was an immigrant and a single mom. And her mom explicitly taught her, like, if you want to get ahead and be successful, you have to ask for everything that you want. Mm -hmm. And I love that story because it shows how much it matters that we have those type of types of role models, that we have those types of people who are explicitly telling us, and for her, it was from a young age. So it's stuck that that's important. And also that that's okay. And, and I, don't, I didn't ask her this, but she probably told her, like, there's going to be people who don't like it. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Ask for everything that you want. Love that. So ask, like, today. Like, challenge yourself. Can you yeah. ask, like, one or two for two more things? Because I can see that where people are like, oh, that's so opportunistic. And it's like, yeah, but if you don't ask, you don't get. Like, the answer is always no. Yeah, and then I actually looked up the definition of opportunistic because I found myself judging people for asking for too much definition of opportunistic is people who ask for everything that they want, but they are also kind of like, you know, that expression, like people, you know, stepping on someone up, up the ladder. So yeah. it would be like, if I asked you for this interview and then, um, also like sold the recording and didn't give you any of the money and then like also didn't support you when you had your book. So that would be me being opportunistic, but like, it's important. And I mentioned this because like we make up these stories about, how women are, you know, and a lot of times it's not true. We just, it's a stereotype. Mm -hmm. I love that because, and it, it's like, and I, I don't know if I've ever had that happen to me where I felt like I was being taken advantage of. I have. Of, you have? 
yeah. Not very oh, often. Really? Yeah. And, and there's honestly, like, I, I, I have a little bit of respect for those people. Yeah. Because that takes, that takes courage. That takes, what is it called? Like, chip spa? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, like, and it's also, to your point, it's like, you can stand in your power and be like, no. Like, right. this is a little too and much. And that's what I've done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So just... And how, how you, like, how did you get to that point, right? Like, like sometimes it's like, oh, I feel like I'm bulldozed over. But how did you get to that? Where yeah. I say no? Yeah, or where you're like, this is like too much. Boundary. Very uncomfortably. Mm. Yeah, I had a situation where there was a woman who wanted me to introduce her to, I did not even know her. And she wanted me to introduce her to like all these people that I knew in the industry. And I was like, I don't know you. Like we don't have a relationship. And I said no. And I and it was it was like in Facebook Messenger and I just I said no. And she asked me why not. And I said, I don't feel like I owe you an explanation. And 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 then it just got really awkward and this back and forth. And I was like, okay, you know, <laughs> this is this is what people mean when they are when they say like I'm conflict avoidant or I don't like confrontation. And I, and I just, I thought to myself too, this isn't that bad, you know, and this is probably like the, like one of the worst case scenarios where she was sort of taking it the wrong way. And, and anyway, it just got really awkward really fast. I, she probably unfriended me. And, um, but yeah, it's not really confrontation. It's just a hard conversation. And I think sometimes that's where the, where the confusion is. Mm -hmm. Nobody likes confrontation. Nobody mm -hmm. likes conflict. And if they do, you're a sociopath. And you right. shouldn't want to be friends with them. Like, like it's just a hard conversation. Mm -hmm. I don't enjoy them, but I do them anyway. And so with the confidence piece, do you find that like the more you do it and the more you step into it, the easier it becomes, right? I have read everything that there is on self-confidence and the research um, because I, I talk about it a lot. And I was like, I'm going to make sure that like I'm not wrong. So I read all these books. Luckily, I wasn't. But yes, that's what the research shows is that we gain self-confidence through action and experience. We gain self-confidence through mastery and competence, becoming great at something. And then for women, we also gain confidence through unlearning all the BS that we've been taught about what it means to show up in your life and make noise. Yeah. I'm so excited for your book and, Thank and you, babe. and your book club and everything. I think it's so needed. Um, everyone get a copy or two for a friend. Um, and just, yeah, I'm so excited to have this conversation and dive deeper into this work because it's so needed. It's so needed. Thank you. Um, so much. I'm going to type in the, um, the link and pin it real quick as oh, we yeah. wrap up for people mm -hmm. and thank you so much for having me. And I want to say again, for people that just joined us that, um, Kelly is the best hype woman ever in the world. <laughs> Andrea, please. I like I hype things up that I want and believe in and your books are just life changing. Your work is life changing and yeah, anything that I can do to support you and I want my community to get it. Um it went out in my newsletter today, so oh, thank you. Like, yeah, it's it's just a book that is needed and really for women, because there's so many women that I have even coached throughout the years that like, these are, these are the nuggets. Like these are the things, you know, the confidence, the, the resiliency, the taking up space, all of it. It's it, it, but life changing. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And that's what, you know, I, I, I wrote this book for my daughter um, and she's 11. She wasn't as excited as I thought she would be. Unfortunately, <laughs> she thinks I'm so uncool. I'm like, I have 50,000 TikTok followers. She's like, <laughs> anyway, oh I, I wrote it because I want this to continue for the next generations because that's how social change is created. It takes a while. It takes generations for things to change. There, there are certain syst systemic issues that I think are taking way too long, but I, I want this to become a conversation that happens more often than not. Well, thank you for blessing this book and birthing this book um, into the world and everyone get a copy and any, any last words. I know I said that like, 
I don't think so. I think just the bonuses are at andreaowen.com slash noise. And thank you. It is also really beautiful. I had my, my a manicure to match. Um, <laughs> just probably one of my favorite covers of my books. And so, yes, beautiful. thank you. For having me. And thank you, everybody, for showing up. Yes, thank you. All right, my love. So we'll be in touch. And everyone, get the book. Get into Andrea's world. And uh, we'll talk soon. Congratulations. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.